You're listening to Lifelong Learning on ReachMD. The following program was recorded at the 2018 Annual Meeting for the Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professions. Here is your host, Alicia Sutton. Okay, thank you for joining us. We are at the Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professions at their annual meeting in Orlando. And my guests are going to talk to me about how to use predictive modeling to maximize educational impact. So we're looking forward to hearing about this and you presented it already. Please introduce yourselves. I'm Jamie Ryder. I'm Director of Educational Outcomes at CME Outfitters. Thank you for having us. By the way, this is really exciting. We're pleased. And I have a background, and I earned my PhD from the University of California, Irvine, Department of Cognitive Sciences, and I developed some mathematical models to analyze data, neuropsychological data, and ever since then, it's been my passion to look at different ways of analyzing data, existing data as opposed to gathering new data, and so that's sort of where the predictive modeling came in. I'm super excited and geeked about sharing it with the industry and anybody else. That's fantastic. Geeks are our favorite interviews, so that's good. And Whitney, please. So I'm Whitney Failer. I'm the Director of Accreditation here at CME Outfitters. I earned a Master's in Public Administration from Virginia Tech several years ago and really looked at a lot of organizational change, behavior change within organizations. And I really am excited how we can apply that for education when we look at whether it's from an organization standpoint of change, but educational activities, because that is an organization when you get down to it. Sure. So give us kind of a big picture of what your learning lab was about here. It was about different modeling, in regression modeling in particular, is that correct? In particular, yes. I'm going to let Whitney kind of give just the general overview, and then I might add on to what you wanted. Okay. When we look at outcomes, we're often just checking boxes in the traditional sense and being able to add a level of, well, did that education actually do something rather than did you like the chicken dinner and was the speaker engaging? It gives us a little bit more as we go through post-tests and evaluations that ask for follow-up, you know, did you retain that information? And now it's when we can add confidence or behavior as an implication to better inform our needs assessment for the next activity. You know, sometimes you're going to fail. And that's okay, and because that's going to inform you to be able to be successful in the future. Right. So one of the reasons why we value predictive modeling is because most of us, you know, we see improvements in outcomes, and occasionally we don't, very rarely, of course. But whether we see improvements in outcomes or whether we don't, it's really important to understand why we're seeing those improvements, because if we can repeat a successful formula, of course, we want to do that in future activities. Or if we can identify a reason why something wasn't successful, then we can make changes in the in future activities. So a lot of times we want to look at demographics and confidence, knowledge, and see if that has an impact on, on clinician behavior. Ultimately, we want to maximize education impact right because hopefully that will lead to improved patient outcomes and I think in your presentation you were referenced a few different models of doing that measurement Mm -hmm. do you have some that you really love and some that you're not of course so actually there are several types of predictive model and kind of going off on on what Whitney was saying Usually in outcomes, we measure changes in, from pre to post, and that's we need to do that, and that's important, and that kind of tells you the if in terms of outcomes. What predictive modeling does is it tells you the why, and there are different ways to do that. So there are different forms of predictive modeling. There's regression, there's naive bays, there's neural networks, there's... CHAID, which is an acronym, C-H-I-D stands for Chi-Square Automatic Interaction Detection, and then there are some others, and the workshop covered regression, but what we do at CMA Outfitters is we use CHAID because that enables us to look at both continuous and categorical variables in a single model. There's some limitations in regression in terms of that, and then also I love the output because it's a visual tree format, and it shows you kind of the breakdown of the response variables, and it's kind of hard to explain, but it's a really good way of looking at the data and looking at the results. But regression definitely has its value and Mm -hmm. it's more straightforward and I think that's a good starting point for a lot of people which is why I focused on that in this workshop. And how do educational designers get started in thinking about how to construct their education that will be easier to measure? 
Does it impact it that way? Are you seeing that? I mean, obviously you're an education company, so are, do you often think about the end first? And what, yeah, that's what I meant. Yes. I didn't word we, it very clearly. Yes, I think you here across the industry start with the end in mind mm-hmm. and the plan, do, study, act model, which is incredibly important from the accreditation standpoint. And everything we do, we start with a kickoff after we have our needs assessment, we have our proposal, and then we say, okay, here's what it's going to look like. And that absolutely includes your content and how are we going to measure this? What are our outcomes going to look like? That is our our square one for any activity that we start working on. Mm -hmm. And part of that is going to be when you develop a proposal, you want to look at your target audience. You want to look at what you're going to measure, how you're going to measure it. And so one of the things that the predictive modeling can help inform is, for example, if you found that academic degree influenced behavior, then you might want to target certain audiences based on academic degree. Or if you find something, and I can give you an example of what we found at Senior Outfitters, is we found that confidence oftentimes predicts behavior Mm -hmm. so that the more Mm -hmm. confident you are, the more likely you are to perform a behavior. It makes perfect Mm -hmm. sense. So not only is predictive modeling really cool in my mind, you know, to get at the why, but then what do you do with it? And one thing that we are doing at CM Outfitters is trying to find ways to improve clinician confidence Mm -hmm. with the hope that that will translate to improved behavior. And one of the things we want to experiment with, this is all new, is see if reinforcement activities help build confidence. So we're starting to build that into our design and to see if, in order to measure whether or not it actually is improving confidence, of course, we have a control group. And so these are the kinds of things you can actually take the data from the model and help inform the design of your future activities. That's good. And that, that, that's what I was trying to get to and didn't word it very well about how you would go about constructing new education, knowing what you've learned from other activities that you saw. Okay, you know what? You're right. we got to get their confidence up, competence into a certain area. So that's good. How do companies go about kind of getting started on thinking through that or measuring? Are there some, some basic takeaways from the presentation you made to help people get started with modeling? I'm going to answer your question in in two ways. One is, when I started in this industry, I was director of biostats and research at CME LLC years ago, back in 2009, and I noticed a need for statistics in this industry, and so I gave presentations, and then I took a hiatus from the industry, went to biotech pharma, and I came back, and I was pleasantly surprised to see more statistics out there. And so I really feel that this industry is forward thinking and very willing to do what's going to work and try different methods. And so I think that, actually I might be jumping ahead, but because I think you have a question about like the future. But so that's sort of in the more broad sense. That's good to hear that you've seen that change occur. Yes. Mm -hmm. But specifically to providers, if they're trying to decide how to get started, I think starting with something like regression, just to get your feet wet. One of the things in terms of, there are two questions you want to ask. Which activities do I want to do this on? I would say go for all of them, but that's not always practical. I would suggest maybe starting with activities where your outcomes aren't as favorable in whatever whatever Moore's level you're looking at, whether it's for knowledge or behavior. You pick that activity that's less successful, do the predictive modeling, so then you can maybe get a better sense of why it wasn't successful. And then in terms of what a couple people asked in the workshop today, well, how do you decide what variables to use? Unfortunately, because this is so new in the industry, we don't really have guidelines on what variables to choose. So all I can offer, which I think is helpful, I hope is helpful, I had a few points. One is it's, it's subjective, so what is important to your organization? So... In, in, in terms of selecting variables, we have the response variable, which is the thing you're predicting, like behavior. And then you have your predictor variables, like demographics, confidence, knowledge. And so selecting those, it could be subjective. It could be based on some kind of research precedent. Like I knew from prior literature that confidence oftentimes did predict behavior. So, of course, I wanted to include that in the model. Different organizations might have read up on different literature. You know, academic degree might impact behavior so that you know research precedent maybe what might be important to the supporters also quality of data super important and then one of the conditions in terms of I made it a little technical but getting into predictive modeling you don't want your predictor variables to be correlated okay 
So if they are, then you just drop one of them, and then which one you drop is up to you. But That's interesting. It's, you know, just a way to kind of get started on yeah. that. Yeah. Where, where do you see this heading? Across, this could be any stakeholder answer. It could be, are the supporters going to start looking for outcomes that are done in a certain way? Are educational designers going to start really thinking through, all right, no, we got we got to get our criteria, our, you know, variables in there established early. I mean, what, where do you see this going in, say, three to five years? I think you're going to see a lot more sessions at meetings like the Alliance for how do we measure outcomes, not just we did it, but how, how do we actually go through it? What was your process, you know, sitting in Jamie's session? It's so different from the other sessions because it is, she pulled up her Excel workbook and was showing, here's how I actually did the math. Here are the formulas. And that can be really scary for somebody who is not a, a, a math background or is like, you know, I stopped at algebra in high school and I haven't done it since. But the tools that are available now will allow organizations to get started and, and then bring on someone like Jamie, um, such as, you know, CME Outfitters has done, that can really take it to the next level. But just to play with it, just to get started with it, I think is, you know, incredibly valuable for any organization to, to start to show that, yes, this, this could really make an impact on how we develop education. Right. Yeah. And of course, I would love to see it utilized more. You have to be careful with any statistical procedure. You have to be careful how you use it. There are assumptions that need to be met for each different statistical procedure. Because if you don't meet the assumptions, your results may not be valid. So that's something I I brought up in this presentation. But I also really wanted to make it accessible and friendly so that people can just kind of get introduced to the idea right, and right. start using it. So I'm really, and, the, and that was my goal, to just share with the industry, have people, I, I hope I made it a little bit more friendly in my workshop, maybe not, I don't know, but that's my goal. That's excellent. Have no, people use it. Thank you. Well, I'm sure there was great value imparted and people have walked away with some things to try in their own practices, but thank you so much for joining us, Jamie and Whitney. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Absolutely. You've been listening to Lifelong Learning on ReachMD, featuring key insights from the Alliance's 2018 annual meeting. To download this podcast and others in this series, please visit reachmd.com slash lifelonglearning.